Uh, as I mentioned tonight, uh, our guest is um, is Dave Collins. He'll be the primary uh, tour leader on the um, on uh, our Civil War 101 program that is going to uh, be conducted the second week in June. Uh, you can see some of Dave's history there. It went went by quickly, but um, uh, Dave, uh, delighted to have you with us. Uh, before we get into your uh, presentation, um, tell us. Uh, how is it that you got, uh, how did a doctor end up so interested and involved with the, uh, the Civil War? Well, Lenny, I wanna thank you uh, for that kind introduction and thank you for allowing me to uh, participate in, uh, in giving a tour with your organization. I, uh, my, listening to everybody else who uh, presented, uh, I come off to the Civil War uh, from a different angle. My, my background is in, in the hard sciences, uh, geology, earth science, chemistry, physics, of course, medicine. And I haven't taken a course in history since I was uh, over 50 years when I was in high school. Uh, I come basically to the Civil War through the game of baseball, but not through Abner Doubleday. I used to attend a lot of baseball card shows and I happened to be in line uh, with some guys who were Civil War enthusiasts. And they attended the Civil War Institute and they invited me to go along with them. And lo and behold, uh, we, we used to live in a house outside of Gettysburg. And one of the people who was in the house with us was Alan Nolan, who wrote the book on the Iron Brigade. And he regaled us with some of his uh, stories and I became part of the entourage, the Alan Nolan entourage, along with uh, some of my friends, Pete O'Flynn, uh, Dave Rodriguez, uh, the Harley brothers, Dave Hills. And we helped take care of Alan uh, when he, uh, he came to Gettysburg. And that's a little bit different, I think, than most of the people here in, in, who've presented. The one common thread is that my mom and my dad took me uh, to battlefields especially in, in upstate New York. Uh, I, my family's half Polish. I lived on Pulaski Street in Amsterdam. And my mother uh, donated money to the Kosciuszko Monument uh, at uh, Saratoga. Uh, Thaddeus Kosciuszko was a military engineer, a noble son of Poland, it says on his, uh, uh, on his monument there. And my mother, showed me and taught me that he designed, he uh, made the decision where the American army was gonna fight. He noticed the uh, advantage of uh, placing guns on Bemis Heights. And then being my mother being a school teacher, she had to bring some science into it. So she would talk about uh, geology. She would talk about uh, glaciers at Saratoga. And it wouldn't be common for us to be walking the field and she would see a rock and the rock would have, have striations with it. And she would tell me a glacier came this way, made these uh, uh, indentations in this rock. So I think that uh, I share one thread with uh, a lot of the guys and two threads a little bit uh, out of the ordinary, let's say. Now, now um, uh, with that, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, interested in uh, what you're gonna do with us in uh, presentation at Gettysburg. So why don't, you, why don't you go ahead and give that to us? Well, then I, I always look, when I look at a battlefield, I look at, uh, I look at the land. If you read Rick Atkinson's books on uh, the trilogy, on the American involvement in Europe and their World War II, he quotes, topography is fate. A professor, Kevin Weddle at the Carlisle Army War College wrote a book, The Complete Victory on Saratoga. His book, he states, in war, geography is everything. Ed Bars said that topography decides who's going to live, who's going to be killed, and who's going to be wounded. So I always look, when I go to a battlefield, I always look at the geology and the, uh, how the, the battlefield get formed the way it did. And uh, geologists state that uh, we have something called the plate tectonic theory. Basically, the earth is divided up into plates and they float on a, a sea of magma. And about 380 million years ago, the North, the, um, North American plate 
collided with the Eurasian and the African plate to form a continent called Pangaea. Now this collision uh, caused the mountains to be uh, formed here in the Eastern United States. Those were the Appalachian Mountains. And for, for us who studied the Battle of Gettysburg, that collision formed the Allegheny Mountains. It also formed the Blue Ridge Mountains, also formed South, uh, South Mountain Ranges. And about that same time, there was a uh, fault in some of the rocks at, uh, in, in South Mountain. A fault is a crack in the rock with lateral displacement. That fault over millions of years will be eroded into what we know now as Cashtown Pike. Now, okay. as, as the, uh, these tectonic plates separated, the earth, the mantle became stretched and in, became weak. And into that weakness, magma was allowed to penetrate. And it's going to, magma is going to get close to the surface in over 380 million years. Uh, that's going to be eroded. And that magma, we know that magma today as Powers Hill, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, Devil's Den, and also Seminary Ridge, uh, going up to Oak Ridge and to uh, Oak Hill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, over the millions of years, uh, the, what became the Gettysburg Battlefield at one time was covered by a sea. So you're going to get a lot of erosion, and it's going to cause uh, dirt and loam and silt to form in this area. And over time and over pressure, uh, uh, basically, we're going to get sedimentary rocks formed. You're going to get sandstone. You're going to get limestone. You're going to get shale. Now, some mm -hmm. of these rocks are a little bit more resistant to erosion than other rocks. Okay? And over the years, over the billion, millions of years of, of, of history of the Earth, uh, the more resistant rocks are going to uh, still stand as the least resistant rocks are, are going to be eroded away. We're going to know those ridges as uh, Lohr's Ridge, Whistler's Ridge, Schoolhouse Ridge, Hare's Ridge, McPherson Ridge. Now, I contend we're going to try to show in this talk that geology favored the Confederacy as they advanced up into Gettysburg. But at the battle, geography, geology favored the Union forces. That's basically a, a different view of the, uh, the battlefield. And uh, we can see the overlapping Blue Ridge Mountains to the south and, and, and South Mountain. And we can see the Cashtown Pass. Okay, we have see the formation of Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge down to the to Little Round Top and to the Devil's Den. That's all igneous rock. Uh, before we get into the actual campaign, I'm doing going to do a little house cleaning uh, right now. There are about six things I use uh, to study a battlefield. Six criteria that I like to have under my belt when I go to a, a battlefield. And one of those criteria is the organization of the army. Now, the, the basic uh, building block of, the, uh, of both armies was the regiment. Regiment is going to be made up of 10 companies of about 100 men each on day one. On day two, that number is going to decrease. Some men are going to be assigned different functions and assigned uh, to different uh, uh, duties. Some men are going to end up in the hospital. And believe it or not, on day one, some men are, are, some men are going to die. Now, two or three regiments are going to make up a brigade. Two or three brigades are going to make up a division. And two or three divisions are going to make a corps. And two or three more corps are going to make up an army. This was the organization of both armies at the Battle of Gettysburg. This campaign is going to start on June 3rd, 1863, when uh, Robert E. Lee is going to take his army, the Army of uh, Northern Virginia. He's going to steal a march on the Union Army. He's going to get behind uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains, extending the, to the South, um, South Mountain. He's going to use that as a screen. 
keep his army hidden from the Union Army. Now, why did Lee go north? I think there are about five reasons. Number one, he wants to achieve a military victory, which is going to have political consequences. Wants to defeat the Union Army and defeat them so well and, and devastate that army so that it's gonna to lead to a political solution formation of the uh, Confederate States of, uh, of America. But also he's going north. This is a big forage expedition. He's going to try to collect as much food as he can. Uh, he's going to bring home beef. He's going to bring beef on the hoof. He's going to bring back flour, corn, everything he get his hands on in the north. And what he brings back with him will feed his army until about October 1863. Now, Lee knows that as he moves, the Union Army is going to follow him and he will get the Union Army out of Virginia. Where I come from, my neck of the woods, the Mohawk Valley was the breadbasket for the American Revolution. The Shenandoah Valley is the same thing. It's the breadbasket for the Confederate Army. Uh, Perhaps with the Union Army out of uh, Virginia, the Southerners will be able to plant a crop. They may be maybe able to harvest a crop. Another reason he's going north is to uh, perhaps influence the elections that are coming up in 1864 and maybe get uh, 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 an administration which is more receptive to an independent Confederate States of America. And the last reason I think he's going north is that he still thinks that he can uh, get a great victory over the Union Army and influence the European powers to come uh, and break that Union blockade, perhaps come in on the side of the South, enter the war on the side of the South. I personally think that the Emancipation Procl Proclamation takes that right off the table. Now, about a quarter way up that map, we see the word Stuart. That's it. Stuart uh, commands a division of cavalry in the Confederate Army. What is the function of cavalry at the time of the Civil War? I like to keep it simple, keep it to three reasons. Number one, find out where the enemy is. Number two, don't let the enemy find out where you are. And, and number three, report back to the commanding general any topographical, any, any hills, any topographical areas which they may hold, which would be advantageous for them to hold. Now, as Stuart starts to make his, uh, he's going to be ordered to get on the advance in Pennsylvania of, of the Confederate Army. And as he starts to ride into towards Pennsylvania, the Union Army is going to get in his way. And basically, he's going to have to go around the Union Army. He's going to be out of communication with Lee for a number of days. So basically, Lee is making this advance into Pennsylvania. He's going to be blind. He's going to be deaf. He's not going to have an idea of what the Union Army is going to be doing. Now, June 28th turns out to be a pretty important day in uh, this campaign. For the Union Army on June 28th, at that time, the commander is a fellow by the name of Joseph Hooker. Hooker is having a disagreement with the Lincoln administration about uh, his, uh, his job. He feels that he cannot defend the cities of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. without the Union garrison at Harper's Ferry. And because he's denied control of that uh, garrison, he offers his resignation. And uh, President Lincoln accepts the resignation and he names George Gordon Meade to be commander of the Union Army. So I like to think of this as, as Lee is, I mean, uh, Lincoln is, is changing horses in midstream. We're going to have to find out whether that's going to be beneficial for the Union Army. On this same day, Lee gets some information, finds out from a spy that the Union Army isn't where he thinks it is. Lee thinks that the Union Army is still in Virginia. 
he finds out that the Union Army is 35 miles away in Frederick, Maryland. This concerns Lee. With the Union Army that close, Union cavalry can go through the passes in South Mountain and intersect Lee's way of getting back into Virginia. Lee is going to use the Great Valley to advance into Pennsylvania. And that's the way he's going to go back home. He's very concerned about that. So Lee is going to concentrate his army east of South Mountain. Lee has two sources of intelligence throughout the entire Civil War. Number one is, is, is Jeb Stewart, his, his cavalry commander. Second are Union newspapers. Lee knows that the Army of the Potomac, the Union Army, has to defend Washington and Baltimore and always be between Lee and those two cities. He knows that. So he's going to fix the Union Army so they're not going to move. He's going to concentrate his army east of South Mountain. He is going to use Cashtown Pass, which is the largest pass in South Mountain, which can accommodate, there it is, and that can accommodate wagons and artillery. 10 roads converge at Gettysburg. Armies march on roads. Those are the reasons that Lee is going to concentrate uh, here at, uh, uh, at Gettysburg. And ge it's the geology, he has used the geology of the area to his advantage. He has used uh, the Great Valley, he has shielded his army with two mountain ranges, and he's going to use the uh, Cashtown uh, uh, Pike Pass, and also he's going to use the Carlisle uh, Pass to concentrate his army east of South Mountain, fixing the Union Army to his front. On June 30th, uh, Harry Heath, who's a division commander in Lee's army, is going to send uh, some troops under a fellow by the name of Pettigrew toward Gettysburg to look for supplies, shoes. Now, I think it's a myth that they went, they fought at Gettysburg for shoes, but however, on June 30th, two months after uh, the battle, Harry Heath will write in the, the, his operative report of the battle that he went looking for supplies, parenthesis, shoes. And it was nice to hear Scott Hartwig two or three weeks ago. He concurs with that idea that Lee uh, Heath went looking for shoes on, on June 30th. But they also have orders not to get involved, not to start a fight if they see any Union troops. And as they get closer to Gettysburg, they see Union cavalry in Gettysburg. And Pettigrew will go back to Heath and to the Corps commander who is Ambrose Powell Hill, and will tell them we saw Union cavalry in Gettysburg. Well, both Hill and Heath don't believe him because they have not been informed by uh, Lee that Union Army is as close as it is in Frederick, Maryland. So Heath is going to uh, order Pettigrew to take a reconnaissance in force. What's a reconnaissance in force? Basically, it's just a big enough uh, uh, army unit that can get themselves out of any trouble that they find themselves into and then retreat back and tell the commander what they found. Now, that Union cavalry that uh, Pettigrew saw is commanded by uh, John Buford. He commands a division of cavalry at, at Gettysburg. He's going to come up to Gettysburg through the uh, via the uh, Emmitsburg Road. And the first thing he's going to see at the, at, the bottom, at the bottom is Cemetery Hill. That is the key terrain of the battlefield. Now, Buford's very experienced cavalryman has fought Indians. He's a graduate of West Point. He's fought the Indians, he's fought the cavalry, very well experienced and knows the advantages of high ground. What are the advantages of high ground? Number one, great fields of observation and fields of fire. Number two, 
the men climbing up the hill are going to get tired. And if they may be able to expose and uh, take advantage of any breaks in the uh, attacking lines. I know uh, Bill McKinnon, uh, my friend Bill McKinnon is on, on the uh, program with us. Bill and I are both physicians. We can both tell you that in medical school, the first year of medical school, you always ask people, how many flights of stairs can you climb before you get tired? Basic question. Same thing in the army. The men climbing up the hill are going to get tired. And the third advantage of high ground is you don't know what's on the other side. So Cemetery Hill is the key. Now, because there's no Union, and there's no uh, Confederate cavalry, Union cavalry will have free access to no man's land. That's the area between both armies. So the Union cavalry are going to follow Pettigrew right back practically to the, confe to the uh, uh, Confederate lines, and they'll report back to him about the defenses. Now, Buford is going to imply, apply something which we call the, an active defense. An active defense is the piece of property that you want to defend, you will defend f far away from it and hope that somebody else in your army comes to that, that piece of property. Pa a passive defense is that if Buford had decided to defend at Cemetery Hill and give up all the other land in the city of, of Getty and, and the town of Gettysburg. So he uh, has his, uh, uh, has scouted the area and he is aware of these ridges, Whistler's Ridge. We can go to the word Whistler there, the Whistler House. We can point that out, Karen. Uh, next, go up to the, go up. You have to go up quite a bit. Follow the dots and we'll tell you when to stop. Uh, oh, you went too fast. Go down a hair. That's okay. That's Whistler Ridge right there. You go back a little bit, you're to on along the Cash Town Pike, uh, Karen, and you're gonna find schoolhouse. There's schoolhouse ridge. You go back a little bit further, you have Harris Ridge. You go back a little bit further, you have McPherson Ridge. So what what Buford is going to do, that he's going to put out an early warning system called vedettes. Vedettes are a group of soldiers together. They act as an early warning system or a tripwire. And what I want you to think about, I want you to think of these ridges as speed bumps. Buford is going to play, he's going to uh, trade time land for time. He's going to trade land for time. And eventually he's going to trade men and land for time and wait for the Union Army to advance to Gettysburg and occupy Cemetery Hill. So uh, he doesn't know it at the time, but the fellow coming up the road, Henry Heath, also graduated from West Point. I think they were one year apart and I think I've read someplace that they used to play chess against one another. They took the same courses. So uh, basically, the Union plan is going to be delay any advance coming from, uh, uh, from the West uh, and use those ridges as speed bumps to delay them as long as possible. Can we go to the next slide, Karen? Okay, this is what happens on uh, July 1st. The Confederates are going to make their advance onto Gettysburg. The first shot is gonna be fired at the Whistler House. Then the Union uh, Cavalry will be pushed off of Whistler's Ridge. They will retreat to Schoolhouse Ridge. And another speed bump they will be pushed off of Whistler's Ridge to Hare's Ridge. It's another speed bump. And at Hare's Ridge, the Confederates form for battle. Buford knows this is going to take 90 minutes. Study that at West Point. And the final decision, the final line is going to be at McPherson Ridge. And at the bottom, uh, we see that the Union Army is, is advancing toward that position. 
The Union Army, uh, that part of the Union Army that's toward Gettysburg is a, is a wing. That wing commander is a fellow by the name of John Reynolds. He's the commander of, uh, in that wing, the 1st Corps, the 11th Corps, and the 3rd Corps. And he will meet with uh, Buford, and they will decide that, yes, Cemetery Hill is the key terrain, and that the battle, if they're going to have a battle, it's going to be fought on this uh, piece of property. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about and, and the tour, and because this is basically a, a beginner's tour, and we're going to try uh, to uh, entice a lot of young people uh, to continue to study the Battle of Gettysburg, I'd like to bring up the leadership of, of Buford, especially for the young people. How many of us have been in a position where we've had to make a decision when the head guy is not there? Buford can't call Reynolds and he can't call Meade because there's no telephones, there's no walkie talkies, there's no semaphore, there's no telegraph lines. Buford has got to make a decision on his own and he's going to use his experience He's going to use his knowledge. He's going to use his training as an officer in the U.S. Army he received at West Point to make a decision. And he's going to hope that the head guy backs him up when they, when they meet. Now, we don't really know what Buford didn't leave us a good message or a good story of why he decided to fight at Gettysburg in, his, in the operative report. And, and to... Uh, Tell some people a little bit about the end of the story. Reynolds is not going to survive the battle. But we only have the last message that he says, that he sent an oral message that he's going to, that Reynolds is going to send to Meade. And basically, uh, it's going to say that uh, he fears that the Confederates will get the land hills beyond the town before he can reach them. He can get there, but he will defend, put up barricades in the city and hold them back as long as possible. And I think that is definitively says that uh, Cemetery Hill is the, is the keep uh, terrain. Uh, now, that is what we're going to talk about on the tour at uh, stop number one. That stop number one is going to be the Buford uh, Monument. And Lenny and I have put uh, a lot of time into uh, uh, the tour. And basically, uh, as he said, we hope to get as many young people on this tour and maybe hook them on onto the Civil War. And, and we don't know what's going to hook these people. So uh, Gettysburg 101 is going to be a, uh, a survey course on everything that we can expose them to on the Civil War. Uh, we're going to talk at, uh, basically at, at this stop, we're going to talk about cavalry. The next stop is going to be at the railroad cut, where we're going to talk about infantry, infantry tactics, and we'll also talk about uh, the weapons. Uh, we're also going to bring in art, and, and, and I consider that sculptures is, is art, so I think Gettysburg has the greatest collection of outdoor sculpture in the world. So we're going to talk about the, the monuments and the story that they tell. Then we're going to go to Oak Hill. Oak Hill, we're going to talk about uh, artillery. We're going to talk about distances. And we're going to uh, wind our way uh, plus past um, uh, Blocker's Knoll, Barlow's Knoll, talk about a New York lawyer who advanced his uh, troops uh, without orders and was outflanked. We're going to uh, hope, maybe if we have the time, we're gonna stop and see a mural that's painted on, on Coster, uh, Coster Avenue, appealing to maybe there's some people who wanna study art, you try to get them hooked on the Civil War. Then we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna set up the Union attack, uh, Confederate attack on day two at the uh, Louisiana and Mississippi Monument. We're gonna go to uh, Peach Orchard, set up the Union uh, uh, defense. We're going to go to Little Round Top. We're gonna to spend some time on Little Round Top 
uh, talking about uh, the significance of it in the union line. I'm going to talk about, um, uh, we're going to take you to the military crest. Military, not too many people go to the military crest. Definition of military crest is two things. Either uh, it's a, where you can stand on, the, uh, on a hill in such a way that the enemy can't hide from your fire, or when you stand up, you're not silhouetted against the horizon. I, I kind of like the second definition. We're going to talk a little bit about the 20th Maine. We're, and we're going to talk about the leadership of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain before he came to Gettysburg. Again, for the, for the new people, for the young people, how, to, how, how does a leader lead men into, into battle? We're going to spend some time on Little Round Top. That is one of the iconic views in all of American history. Probably compares uh, with uh, standing on Omaha Beach, as far as the view is concerned. And then we're going to walk through the into the wheat field and go around and go around top two. We're going to talk about the signal corps. We're going to talk about the Corps of Engineers. When we get to the wheat field, we're going to talk about medicine. And we're going to show uh, where there was a field hospital on the battlefield, which was uh, uh, started by um, uh, Boylston Adams of the 32nd Massachusetts. And then uh, at, at the end of the day, we're going to end up someplace. Uh, either at the Mississippi Monument or the Pennsylvania Monument or the New York Auxiliary Monument, or uh, we may be blessed by Father Corby. I don't know if you can tell, but I have Father Corby in back of me in the picture, blessing the Irish Brigade at Antietam. Maybe Father Corby will uh, bless us there at uh, Gettysburg. That's going to be the first day. On the second day, we're going to try to use all those concepts which we developed on the, our first day of tour, we're gonna to try to apply them on the battlefield at Culp's Hill. We're gonna spend the entire morning on Culp's Hill. It's gonna be three and a half hours. We're going to start at the top. We're gonna to discuss the monuments and the story that they tell us. And we're gonna uh, look where the traverse was. And we're gonna use some of, the, some of the, our concepts from day one, why we think the traverse or why I think the traverse was placed where it was. We're going to go down uh, to the uh, uh, Spangler Spring, and then we're going to walk back up Culp's Hill, recreating the attack on the third day. Culp's Hill tends to be one of the more confusing parts of the battlefield because it has seven hours of continuous fighting and they fought based on both days. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, very confusing, and I try to simplify it as best I can. So people, at least I have a, a working knowledge. After a scrumptious lunch, I know that Lenny's going to have for us, we're going to go to, uh, we're going to walk Pickett's Charge. We're going to talk about how 12,500 men could make this advance. And and I'm going to take people out of the audience uh, to, to, to uh, you, um, emphasize that point. And then we're going to walk over to the uh, uh, cemetery. I like to end all tours, whether I tour uh, uh, with another guides or I go visit other battlefields. I like to end tours in, in a cemetery to pay uh, homage to the, the men who, who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms. And I, maybe if I can memorize it, I can uh, recite the uh, Gettysburg Address. I did it in fifth grade, I think I can do it again. And as a, a sidelight, I think I'd like to point out, it's been lost to history where the platform where, where Lincoln stood. That's been lost to history. And guys who study the, the battlefield a battle more than I do, there are about two areas we can look at. So we're gonna, we're gonna be, use a baseball term, we're gonna be in the ballpark of where the, the platform was. So, I think uh, it's, it's, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I'm trying to, I wanna give people the same kind of enthusiasm that I had when I was coming to Gettysburg and I go to the battlefields. It's a lot of enthusiasm. You can't wait. You can't wait to see some old friends. You can't wait to meet some new friends. Uh, you, uh, you, you cry with us, you, you laugh. And I wanna share that with, with uh, uh, some of the young people, because we have a generation of people, and now's the time if we can, if we can hook them on Gettysburg, uh, 
uh, it, uh, we got them for the rest of their lives. I'll even go this far. If there's a kid who comes on this tour and he likes dinosaurs, I'll take him to where I can find fossils of dinosaurs on the battlefield if I can get him to come to the Gettys, get him hooked on the Civil War. So that's basically my presentation. Uh, I hope I didn't ramble too much. Uh, first time I've ever tried anything with Zoom like this. So, uh, Lenny, you want to open up to questions? I think that uh, about, we got about 15, 20 minutes, I think, for questions. Sure. A couple, couple of things. Um, uh, Lauren Schaud has asked, um, did both the North and the South know that they were to converge at Gettysburg? And how did they know that? I think... Uh, I, th I think they bunk. I kind of think that they, I don't know the deaf technical uh, terms, but I kind of think they, they bunked into one another. Uh, the Confederates, the Confederates had no idea that the Union Army was so close. The Union Army, because of spies and because of their unimpeded access to, to uh, no man's land, had a, had a pretty good idea. They had a good idea how many men were coming down the Cashtown Pike. They knew that one uh, one uh, corps was behind another corps, and they also knew that a corps was coming in from the north. So, so the Union Army, I think, had a pretty good idea. I'm not too well convinced the Confederates, uh, they didn't have any cavalry. Now, the experts, the experts who are listening are, will, will chastise me for that. I agree. I agree that Lee did have cavalry with him at Gettysburg. He had Jenkins' brigade with Ewell. He had Robertson and uh, Grumble Jones in some of the passes in uh, the South Mountain Range. And he had Imboden over in, in uh, he had Imboden, West Virginia. I don't think Lee used his cavalry uh, as well as maybe he should have. I'll go that far. I think, I think that uh, just to expound on one thing that people are going to attend the, this tour. I've got a handout of how to uh, how to walk a how to walk a battlefield, and well, and, and one of the uh, the six things six things that that I study. Yeah, I'm sure. Go ahead. And the first thing is uh, you have to have a like I presented, you have to have a firm uh, knowledge of the organization uh, of the army, but regiments, divisions, uh, corps. Uh, you have to have done some reading, I think, before uh, going to a battlefield, and you have to have a good map so that you can walk the ground and see where the troop movements are. Uh, you have to be able to estimate distances, and you have to know the range of fire for the weapons at, at uh, that's, that's, I think that's important. You have to have a develop a pretty good eye for terrain and advantages of high ground. You have to have a working knowledge of tactics. You have to have uh, understand how the command structure. And the last one is that you have to have an, an organization. We're going to try to hit every one of these at Gettysburg. We're going to bring tactics into this. We're going to talk about the mechanics. Of, Hello. Of how did, we, did, did Dave just lock up? No, Dave's fine. We're going to talk about the mechanics of how this, how they marched and the mechanics of, 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 of shooting, you know, shooting in straight lines. That's a very, everybody has a question. Why did these guys stand and fight? We're going to answer that question. We're going to go into a little bit of the physics behind uh, firing a weapon. We're gonna look at the chemistry of why, uh, uh, why the cannons are green. There's chemistry behind that. We're going to spend, uh, we're gonna do Civil War uh, medicine. We're gonna do that at the uh, Rock where uh, Dr. Adams, Boylston Adams had his, uh, uh, his hospital. So we're gonna bring in, uh, I think a whole bunch of things. Uh, so we're gonna bring a little bit of science. I'm gonna try to bring in the field of science into the, the Civil War. And we'll, we'll see if it works. We'll see if, if it's successful. I think, uh, I think we're gonna give it a good shot. Okay, uh, Harry Tate asked uh, how we were gonna, how we we're gonna mark this program. I'd like to address that. Um, uh, the program uh, is, is targeted 
basically to make it possible for people who always wanted to bring their kids to the battlefield uh, on, a, on a structured tour to be able to do so. The, um, uh, we have members of our organization have sponsored this program so that while a adult would pay a normal rate and would get a very substantial program for, from us, they can bring their kids along for really just no more than the cost of the meal, which, which will save, uh, you know, four, three, four hundred dollars uh, in registration fees and stuff. And anybody has, uh, wants to know what I, what I used uh, to, uh, to, to, to prepare for this. Uh, first of all, I just want to say the maps, everything is going to be in the handout. A lot of those maps are in the handout for, uh, I don't know if we can see this. This is a blue and gray from February, um, what's the date? February, 1995. Has a very good article by uh, Gary Cross, who's a licensed battlefield guide. That's, uh, and it discusses the, the cavalry uh, fight on the first day. Uh, this is a book I've just picked up. The book goes into the geology of all Civil War battlefields. And this is what I use when I, before I go to a battlefield, this is the book I read. Uh, that's available on Amazon. The Blue and Gray uh, it is no longer in existence, a company, but you can always pick up some of their magazines, I think on eBay. And they have, a, they have about maybe 15, 14 to 15 that are just devoted to Gettysburg. And they give some very good tours in, in, in the back in case you ever wanna do a tour by yourself. Yeah, well, yeah. I guess to follow up on my question, this is Lauren. Um, to follow up on my question is how if they knew they were going to converge at Gettysburg. I guess it really is before the fact. How is it that they both ended up traveling north? Did they have intelligence that said each one of them was heading north for this? How did they know? Well, Lee, Lee is going to go north. Like I said, uh, he's he's coming off the greatest victory. Uh, in, in his in his career, Chancellorsville, but he wants to keep the initiative. He wants the Union Army to respond to what he's doing. Lee knows that if he is forced to respond to what the Union Army is doing, you know, he's he's going to lose the war. So he's going to take the initiative to come uh, uh, to go north. The, the Union Army is going to drag its feet a little bit before they make the decision that Lee has left uh, Virginia and he, and they've gone north. Uh, the North has a very good spy network of civilians that are passing information back to uh, Washington, D.C. And once uh, Stewart leaves the scene, the Union, has, uh, Union cavalry has better access to no man's land. Un Stewart, during the campaign, uh, blocks any attempts of Union cavalry to, to go through the passes. He defeats the, the Union cavalry at Aldi, uh, Upperville, Midville, Middletown, rather Middletown, he defeats. And it's after those battles that Lee sends uh, Stuart to get on the flank of the advance into Pennsylvania. But I, I still think, I don't, th I don't think they intended to, to uh, uh, fight at Gettysburg. I think the geology, the geology dictated that they were, they were going to meet at Gettysburg. They going up the Great Valley using the Cashtown Pipe uh, Pass using the Carlisle Pass. Question that I, uh, that I, sometimes comes up, is why did, why did the Emancipation Proclamation take Great Britain off, off, the, uh, off the stage as interfering in the war? Uh, basically the words of the Emancipation Proclamation are that uh, the, the slaves are free only in that territory commanded by, ruled by the, the Confederacy. So if Great Britain, which had abolished slavery, I think in the early 1800s, uh, abolished slavery in all its colonies and was very instrumental in, in uh, preventing ships uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean filled with slaves, for them to uh, suddenly then support, uh, if they were gonna support the South, then they were basically saying, we're gonna support slavery. I don't, I don't think they were willing to make that, that, uh, that commitment. And, and, they, and they didn't. And the leader of uh, England at the time, Palmerston, was fervently, fervently anti-slavery. So I, I think that, uh, I don't think that they would have ever 
uh, try, try, tried to well, go in on the side of the South. I, Hey, Bill, it's, uh, I'm sorry, Dave, it's Harry Tate. How you doing? Hey, Harry, how you been? Hey, um, I'm, I'm hanging in, hanging in there. Got my shots and uh, rare to go again. Uh, one thing about Lee heading north after Chancellorsville and, and that, uh, that victory, um, I think, and I could possibly have this wrong, and there could be other reasons, he was uh, really on his way to Harrisburg to threaten that state capital. And you could almost say that he, there was no need to even cross over to Harrisburg, I mean, into Gettysburg, just continue on up, except that part of this probe to get Harrisburg was to cross at Wrightsville, which would have taken at least one division across, which is what eventually happens. Of course, the bridge gets burnt, and there's no way that that division can come across the Susquehanna, approach Harrisburg from the uh, southeast, or get in and threaten Lancaster and eventually Philadelphia. Uh, it's kind of interesting how Gettysburg really develops. Uh, I don't think that was in Lee's thinking as he started this, uh, you know, this movement to the north. Well, I think I think he, when he found out that the Union Army was so close and that they they could have intercepted his his way back home uh, and 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 dictated to him where, where the battle was going to. Be, be, especially with his army was divided. Uh, I mean, you've got the third corps, like you said, up in, up near Harrisburg, and you've got uh, uh, you've got his, his other two corps stuck around Chambersburg. But he, he has the advantage of of using uh, uh, the Cashtown uh, Pass. That's the largest pass of all the all those uh, all the passes in South Mountain to concentrate his army, and 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 to fix the Union Army. Use the uh, Union Army can't move, can't move with if because their 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 job is to fight Lee and to stay between Lee and the and the two cities of Baltimore. So they're they're kind of fixed with what they're going what they're going to do. I think what what happened with Lee was. That uh, communication with the, his other corps commanders was was nil, and and you've got Harry Heath, who uh, reconnaissance and force. Once he bunked into the Union cavalry, you know, reconnaissance and force is supposed to then retreat, and to go back to the commander and tell them what they found. What what happens is that Heath decides he's gonna he's gonna take the bait and he's gonna he, he's going to fight. Uh, and, and, and you know the you know the end of the story. The Union Army is going to be on igneous rocks. Uh, igneous rocks form the fish hook. They're not going to be pushed off that land. Hi, folks. I'm I'm back again. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me, Dave? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've been we've been having a nice chat. I, I understand. I apologize, folks. My internet uh, failed. Uh, uh, I've had some problems for the last couple of uh, days with this and. And, and it just it comes and goes. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, we have about time for, uh, for one more question. I missed a few of the conversation, so I'm not gonna try to steer it. Uh, if anybody has a question, go ahead and raise your hand and uh, we'll take one more question and then I'll, I'll wrap it up uh, since we're getting close to nine. Anybody? Okay, Dave, let me, let me go ahead and wrap then. Um, okay. uh, I, what I was uh, addressing, which Harry had asked, um, uh, this program is not going to be light on content. Uh, Gettysburg is robust with themes and lessons learned across the board that um, uh, have been learned over the centuries and will continue to be taught as long as people go and uh, want to focus on Gettysburg and, and on why people fight and so forth. Uh, what we want to be able to do is set this up so that if you ever wanted to bring either uh, grandchildren or anybody who is aware of the Civil War now or, or has that emerging uh, interest, I think, he, I, I think uh, he, going on that theme, I think there's, there's a little, hopefully there'll be a little bit uh, for everybody. Uh, I know that a lot of people, I've taken a number of people, very erudite people on uh, Gettysburg. Uh, a guy that uh, I went to medical school with five years behind me though, uh, a big Gettysburg fan, his name, Tom Ward. 
uh, you know, I've, I've shown him a couple of new things. I showed him where the, where uh, he's a physician. I showed him where Dr. Adams had his hospital. I took him on Culp's Hill. I showed him where the, uh, the Confederate burial pits were. And, and he had never, he had never heard of that. So I think it's, we're going to try to offer something to everybody. And I was telling Len before we got on that a lot, I'm, I'm going to depend on the, 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 the gentlemen and the gentlewomen who bring uh, the rookies, the new, newbies, new guys to civil war, when they go home, we're going to depend on them to get them involved somehow in, in civil war roundtables so that they maintain that interest. And, and, and every month get together, talk about the Civil War, and, and hopefully that will help uh, uh, incite their, uh, their enthusiasm. I think. Uh, okay, that sounds good. Well, guys, uh, you know, I wanna thank you for coming tonight. Uh, and hopefully we will see you uh, next week. Len has the newsletter out. So once again, I wanna thank you for coming and um, see you next week. Thank you, Dave, so much. Hey, Karen, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, the, uh, the excellent work you did with the slides. That, that was a game saver for me. Lenny, thank you very much. Everybody uh, stay safe.